good. <laughs> we are live. Welcome, welcome. I was still dancing to the music. I don't know if you were at home. That intro music gets me going. I love me some Latin tunes, and that just strikes my fancy. So welcome, everyone. This is episode number one. This is Jedediah Vila Live, going this way. And the team here did an amazing job setting up. I'm not alone in the room. I may be alone talking most of the time, especially if Kai here chooses to ignore me, which is very possible. That may happen. Possibly. But um, we have Kai here. Kai's going to be pulling up some clips for us. Uh, Kai's going to be doing some cool interactions with me, hopefully, if he decides that he wants to play the game. We have the team behind me who is setting everything up, making sure everything rolls out real smooth. And I want to just welcome everyone. We have a, also have a big screen of me here, and the guys beforehand were like, is that going to be distracting? And I was like, no way. And now I find myself staring at myself oddly, like, hmm. So I'll try not to do that. I'll try to look directly at you guys. But welcome, welcome, welcome to show number one. And I just want to tell everyone out here who subscribed already, you guys are the VIPs. I mean, we don't even have content up and you are here. That is some love. That is some support. That is some really, really good stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. And I have a few goals that I want to do today on the first show. First of all, I want to intro you to me, who I am, where I come from. For those of you who don't know, I want to intro you to this show and what this show is going to be, what I hope it's going to be, what I hope you're going to get out of it, what we're going to cover, what we're not going to cover. And of course, it wouldn't be me if we didn't dig into some controversy. So I have some controversial topics that we're going to get into um, in the second half of the show. And uh, that's going to be fun as always. I also have this. Bullshit love it. Defcon 5. Oh, it's a bullshit button. And I'm a Brooklyn girl. I come from New York City, Brooklyn and Staten Island, born and raised. And this is a bullshit free zone. So anytime I hear some bullshit, uh, there's a possibility that I might hit that button. You never know. Sometimes I might just hit it for fun because it's kind of cool. And uh, yeah, so there's going to be some of that. So first and foremost, I want to talk to you about why I'm here, because some of you know me from you know, network TV, some of you know me from cable news, and you may be thinking, why a podcast? Why now? What are you doing? You put out a non-political book when you left Fox News. What exactly is going on? So, And those are all great questions. So when I left Fox News last year, there was a, a part of me that really wanted to step away from politics. Politics and political media can be very toxic. Uh, there's a poison that runs deep in there. Um, there's a lot of phonies. There's a lot of phoniness. There's a lot of, it's like the entertainment business on steroids when you get into political media because you also have all of the corruption and toxicity of politics itself. And um, I had this little baby, Hartley, who's now two years old, two and a half. And I said to myself, do I want to do this? And I wasn't 100% sure. I had just, like I said, put out this non-political, you know, pretty much non-political book, Dear Hartley, which was a series of letters to him. And I said, maybe this is my moment. This is my moment to make an exit, to step away, to do some health and wellness stuff that I'm also really passionate about. And then something happened. The vax mandates hit New York City. And I watched my beautiful city that I have loved my whole life and that I learned so much in, grew so much in. I mean, that city taught me how to be a badass, uh, which I am, and I will be forever grateful for that, but I watched it start to sink and turn into a dystopian nightmare right before my very eyes. And um, I didn't get the COVID-19 vaccine. I, I got COVID almost right away when it, was, when it hit New York City and spread around. I didn't get the vaccine. We'll get into some of that too, but I was medically advised against it. It was just a personal decision I made at the time. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go into a restaurant. I couldn't go into a museum. I couldn't, um, I couldn't go into a gym. <laughs> and I watched active discrimination unfold in society in New York City. And I said, you know what? I said, I, I can't be quiet. I need to get loud about this. Um, what people didn't know is that my sweet spot is the intersection of health and wellness and politics, and by politics, I mean freedom, fighting for people's freedom. That's my sweet spot. That's what I really fundamentally care about most at my core. And this and these mandates struck that sweet spot. So I said, okay, I have a child and I love my city and I'm not going to allow the city to sink without me saying something about what's going on. And I can't let the country go the way of New York City. Um, and I started to think about my kid and what I wanted for his future and felt like if people like me decided to just say, oh, this is all too much. I can't take it. I'm out. What would happen? 
And that just wasn't a possibility that I was willing to entertain. So I decided that I needed to get louder. And I decided that I needed to be unfiltered and uncensored, and I needed to go after the powers that be uh, that were responsible not only for policies like this, but other policies that I felt were really doing enormous damage to the country at large and to these amazing cities like like, uh, Los Angeles and California and Chicago and New York City, places that I love with all my heart and that I've lived and breathed and experienced. I saw them all suffering enormously. Um, So... That's why I've gotten louder. That's why we're here. That was the the motivating force that kind of pushed me and said, the time for silence is not now. Um, So now, a a little bit about me before that. I I mentioned that, you know, I I had worked at Fox News. A lot of you know that. You saw me on Fox and Friends Weekend. You you know, you saw me on The Five, shows like that. I co-hosted The View for some time. I could sit here and I could talk about those experiences and what that was like, but truly those moments don't define me or inform who I am or what I'm gonna bring to the table here for you today. So I wanna talk to you about, and plus you can Google those. (laughs) You can search those clips. What I wanna share with you today is more personal um, about who I am and where I came from and why the messages that are gonna ring clear here about potential and individualism and possibility and self-empowerment, where that all came from and why it's so important to me. So I was born, like I said, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I grew up in Staten Island. Kai, I don't know if you have that photo of where I grew up that I can share with everyone. I went back and visited the house that I grew up in. That's where I grew up. I loved, of course, this was taken years and years later. I loved that little house. Um, But it's funny, when people see me now sitting on the platforms that I've been on, they say, oh, sure, well, she's, you know, she's rich and she's, you know, sitting, she probably had a silver spoon and she's not fit to talk about opportunity and she's not fit to talk about low taxes and she's not fit to talk about any of that. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. I grew up in that house that you saw. My parents worked very, very hard to pay the mortgage on that house. What you can't see is obviously that the inside of that house was decorated beautifully by my mom who turns every space into magic. I can't fold a fitted sheet properly, but I have a mom who can decorate any space and make it look like a million bucks. She's listening now. She's like, yes, I can. She gave me a little wink and a smile there. I know you did, mom. But my, you know, my passion for individual rights and my passion for working hard and keeping more of your hard earned cash came from that little girl that grew up in that house that wasn't swimming in money. My family wasn't swimming in money and knew that hard work and achieving goals took time and effort and consistency and all sorts of things. Um, You know, it's funny, if you ever watch the Jersey Shore, uh, Vinny, who I know, who also grew up in Staten Island. We're gonna get Vinny here, by the way. He doesn't know it yet, but he's coming here. Uh, He's gonna talk to me. He (laughs) always jokes with Angelina about the Staten Island dump. That house was actually right by the dump at the time, the Staten Island landfill. And my mom and I used to go crazy because you couldn't you couldn't leave your windows open sometimes because you'd smell the Staten Island dump. I mean, it's crazy. You should watch Jersey Shore and those people who are from Staten Island will get these jokes. I don't know if any of you are from Brooklyn or Staten Island. We're gonna also talk about what that means in terms of my delivery. Let's just say sometimes I get a little colorful. Um, But, you know, I worked my butt off throughout the years. By the way, my parents, my dad was a stamp and uh, coin dealer. And my mom had a bunch of odd jobs. At one point, she was manager of a place in the Staten Island Mall called Fluff and Stuff. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever because she would come home with stuffed animals and little toys and all sorts of cool stuff. But we were just a regular middle class family. Um, They worked really hard to send me to a great school on Staten Island. Um, They spent a lot of their money on me and didn't spend it on themselves, um, which is a tribute to what, you know, good parenting is and what good parents do. And they invested a lot in my education, but um, I had to work and I did work. And I spent a lot of years working my butt off to get college scholarships because I knew that my parents couldn't shell out $42,000 a year for Columbia University. That was just not something that they were gonna be able to do and I wanted to do my part. So my life looks a lot like that hard work, um, struggles. I am no stranger to struggle. I, before I got into teaching, and I'll get to that in a second, I was a cocktail waitress at a few lounges in New York City. I remember one lounge, was my favorite lounge actually, it was two stories, and I worked the 4 p.m. to the 4 a.m. 
Sometimes I made 40 bucks, sometimes I made 400 bucks. It, it really depended on <laughs> what was going on that day. But what was hard about it, and people who have waitressed or cocktail waitress out there will know, the bar was downstairs and the tables were upstairs primarily. So it was like, take an order, go downstairs, get the drinks, go upstairs. My calves were smoking. I was in the best shape of my life, but it was hard. These jobs were really, really hard. Um, I did a couple of those jobs, and, and it's funny, my, my friend Lauren, who's probably listening, always said to me, Chad, you're always like hustling, you're always working towards something, and that was true. That was kind of how I was wired from a very young age. I always had a goal. Even now, I'm doing this, and I'm already like, I wanna do this and this. That's just how I was my whole life, even when it was hard and money didn't come easy. I've been a teacher um, in New York City, I taught in K to 12 schools. I taught in one school on the Upper East Side, um, seventh grade through high school. I was a high school dean there. I also taught a year of college when I got out of grad school. Um, I taught Spanish, actually. My Spanish is rusty, though. That makes me very, very sad. I'm going to have to work with Jorge on that. Jorge's here. He speaks Spanish. I'm going to force him to speak Spanish to me because I miss my Spanish. But um, yeah, that was, and I remember actually that I wanted to live in Manhattan. Manhattan was where the cool kids lived. I, I grew up in Staten Island, but Manhattan was where the cool kids lived. And I wanted to live in Manhattan. So I said, I'm gonna take this teaching job and it paid me $42,000 a year. And I got an apartment, I wanted to live alone. I didn't want a roommate. I was like, this is grown up world. I need to be on my own. I need to take care of myself. And my apartment was, I think 1800 bucks a month. It was 300 square feet. I could touch both walls uh, in the bedroom. I was in my bed, I could just reach out and touch someone and it was two walls. 1800 bucks in New York City, what? Um, when was this? Uh, so I was, this was, I was in my mid 20s. So this, this would be like $6,000 today. Yeah, it was wow. insane. So you know what I did? I was like, I don't have the money for this, obviously, on the salary. So I started a private tutoring business and I said, I'm gonna make extra cash and I would go to school and I would teach, and then I would get out, I'd hop on the subway, I'd go to one student's house, I'd do an hour, I'd hop back on the subway, go to another student's house, do an hour, hop back on the subway. That would go to like nine or 10 p.m. Yikes. But that was the only way I could afford, and I was like, for some reason I felt like it was important for me to, to live alone and kind of, I wanted it to be hard. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be easy. I felt like there's gonna be a grind here that's gonna build something in me. And that came really in handy as the years went on because it seemed like I was always reaching for these really hard, challenging goals. So I was building that backbone up, man, and building backbone up, by the way, to talk about some of the stuff we're gonna talk about that gets a little nitty and gritty, to say the least. Um, I got into TV by accident. I was um, reviewing a bunch of books and writing on a blog and, one of the books that I reviewed was about, uh, it was po it was political. I think it was, I had reviewed Mark Levin's Liberty and Tyranny and it was wild. Mark picked up the review and, and read it um, on air, read segments of it. And then, you know, Sean Hannity's team called me and I was on Fox News and it was kind of a whirlwind. And at first I was like, do I want to, you know, do I want to do this? You know, my best friend always says to me, you were also submitting articles to Runner's World. I wonder what would have happened if those got picked up. I don't know. Because it wasn't, it wasn't that I was so focused on politics, it was that I wanted to have a real conversation about everything and anything. I wanted to sit down and figure out what was broken in life and just kind of feel that out with people. But politics is what stuck at that moment. And I got my first TV contributorship. I think I got paid $50,000 for that. Um, and I was like on TV everywhere and everyone was like, she's getting famous. And I was like, I don't know if I can pay my rent this month because I, it was hard to take a second job because I was, you get called to do TV all the time. Uh, okay. So you have to be available. Yeah, and you're, you're, on, and you're on standby. Yes, and before, by the way, before I even took that contributorship, I had to do a bunch of free TV. Mm -hmm. So I was doing free TV for a couple of years where like, I got into a little bit of debt because I was like, I need to leave my job, my teaching job, so I can be available if this is what I really wanna do. So it was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of nights where I was like, do I wanna do this? Like, am I safer? But I have a, a very safe like dad. My dad is like, just get your job, get your 401k, your, get your you know few thousand dollar increase a year. It's all gonna be great. I just wasn't wired that way. I was always like reaching for mm -hmm. something. And I said, you know what, that's not gonna be me. I'm gonna need to to get a little dirty here. <laughs> so that's what I did. In fact, I I, um, I wrote my first book outnumbered. I self-published it. 
people out there who want to, the reason I'm telling you this is because if you're out there and you want to do hard stuff, you can do it. I self-published my first book. Me and my two friends did the editing. They were very smart, so I trusted them. My best friend's husband took the cover photo. I got dressed up, I did my own hair and makeup, I jumped in the in the street. I was like, this is what the photo needs to look like. He took the photo, so, and, there, and then I went and I got like quotes from like Mark Levin and Sean Hannity and I stuck them on the back and everyone was like, who published this? And I was like, I did on Amazon, <laughs> you know? But I also wanted to, t I always wanted people to know that because you know, there's people out there, it's, you can't just get a publishing deal. You can't just snap your fingers and make these things happen. And it is possible, but it's not easy. And you have to really, really, really want it. And what I really, really wanted was to be in the TV medium and to have really good conversations for the world and kind of bring everyone in. So, and I remember the day that I sat, I think I told this on PBD's podcast uh, a while ago, the day I sat with Roger Ailes and I had, gone into Roger's office and I said, um, I, I need your permission. I was doing a contributorship, but I was bored. Uh, I was really, really bored. I didn't like those quick little segments. And I said, hey, Roger, um, I need your permission to go do The View. They called me and they want me to go. And he was like, ha, ha, ha. He laughed and he was like, you know what? We're gonna give it to you because you're very green and you're not gonna get the job. And I was like, <laughs> So I laughed because I knew I could get the job. And I was like, thanks. I just smiled and left the office. And he did me a huge favor that day because he signed that release form. And also that idea of like, you're very green. You're not going to get the job. He didn't mean, I don't even think he meant it badly. I think he just meant like, I really don't think yeah, you're going to get like it. Offhand comment. Yeah, you're, I don't think you're ready for that job. But I was and I knew it. And I knew that what I was doing at Fox at the time wasn't showcasing all that fire I had in my belly. So I was like, okay, thanks, walked out, got the job. Um, and that was where it all started. But the bottom line is that it didn't happen for me overnight. It wasn't easy. It took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of struggle. I lost money, I made money. I lost money, I made money. But that passion to, to bring something to the table that I really felt good about, that I felt like would help the world, would get conversation going, that was my motivating, motivating force. And when I think about what this show's about, this show is gonna be about possibility. It's gonna be about you. It's gonna be about what you can do, what I can do, what we can do, what we can all do together. Um, it's about freedom. It's about believing in yourself. It's about what you're capable of when obstacles are pushed out of the way, whether that obstacle is high taxes that we talk about or whether that obstacle is you know, you, a vax mandate. I, I mean, any. I don't care what it is. This is about your freedom to be the person that you want to be, bringing to the table what you want to bring to the table. And it's not just going to be a political show. This is going to be a show about health and wellness. We're going to dig deep into food, into fitness, into things that can help you grow into the person that you want to be. If you have your ideal, I don't know if anybody makes a vision board out there. I typically don't, but I just got into one because... I don't know, I think it makes you feel good at the end of the day if you put stuff out there that you want. If anybody does that, this show's gonna help you get there because it's gonna remind you to be self-empowered and all of the things that you're capable of in this life. That's what I wanna do. And of course, I also wanna hold people accountable that are getting in your way. I wanna hold hypocrisy accountable. I wanna be real, I wanna be raw, I wanna be authentic. Um, to give you a little bit of ideas about, this show has no teleprompters. There's no prompters in here. Everything that you see coming out of my mouth is coming out of my mouth, from my head to my mouth to your ears. These are my notes that I wrote. They haven't seen them. Kai's sitting on the edge of his seat. He's like, maybe I should have seen them ahead of time just to make sure there's nothing crazy too late. in there. It's too late, Kai. Too late. Listen, you sign up for something like this, you never know what you're gonna get. Enjoy. Anyway, <laughs> the notes, we got some news articles. This is all me, you know. I, I wanted it to be lightly produced uh, in the sense that, yeah, you know, I, I have people to give me feedback, but I wanted it to be real and authentic and come from me. I didn't want those filters anymore. So that's what you're getting. Um, and I always say to people out there, someone makes it happen, so it may as well be you. If there's something you wanna do out there, something you're excited about, I don't care what it is, somebody does it, right? Somebody becomes a, an amazing skydiver, number one. Somebody becomes an actor, somebody becomes a professional athlete. 
If you want it, you go get it. And this show is going to give you the tools and also going to remind you who you are and what you value um, and help to kind of pull out that seed of who you are that just makes you um, more ready to face the world at large. So, and also, you know, we're going to tear some stuff down. We're going to tear it down. I remember visiting a friend of mine. She was renovating a house and she had me come and see it. And she was like, well, I'm going to leave this part of the house as is and this part, even though I don't really like them. They're not great. I'm going to leave them and I'm just going to tear everything else down around it. And I said, okay. She got into the process of renovating that house. And I remember her coming back to me and saying, I'm unhappy. I don't know why. I don't, I still don't like the house. And I remember saying to her, it's because those two parts of the house are still broken. They're not, they're weakening the foundation. You don't like the colors. You don't, they're old. You're worried about mold, this, that, and the other thing. I said, and she said, well, what do I do? I said, bulldoze it, tear it down and build it from the bottom up the way you want it. And sometimes when you deal with life, with topics, you need to do that. So in some areas, you're going to feel like I say, you know, tear it down. And you're going to be like, oh, Jed, that's extreme. Sometimes that needs to happen in order to build something that's better. Um, And she has since built her own house from the bottom up and she loves it now. So that's just a theme I want you to think about, a metaphor I want you to think about, about where I'm going with this. When when anything sounds like, really, could we tear all that down in the educational system? Yes. And sometimes you have to. And we'll get to topics where that hits home. Um, So before I get to topics today, and I want to focus on some topics with you today, I want to show you another photo. Kai, can you bring up that photo of Hartley? Yep. So that's my baby boy. Oh my gosh, look at him, I love him. He is so happy to be in South Florida. You can see it right there on the beach. Um, The reason I'm showing you this picture, that is the love of my life. That is everything. That's my start to finish, my sun, my stars, my morning, my afternoon. That is the reason, he is the reason that I fight. He is the reason I got back into this. He is the reason that I'm so passionate about these topics. He is the reason that I speak so vocally about health and wellness and freedom and opportunity because I am concerned, very concerned about where this world, this country in particular is headed on many issues. And when I think about that baby, I want better for him. I want him to be free. I want him to grow up in a place where he can believe in himself, where he can grow into the person he wants to be. I want him to go into school and I want them to welcome him however he feels on issues. I don't want him to be in an indoctrination zone. There's so many things I want for that little boy. Um, I want him to, to, to be free to grow into someone who may disagree with me and, and have those debates. But he is the reason that I fight. And he and, and I'm fighting for him. I'm fighting for your kids. I'm fighting for your nieces and nephews. I'm fighting for you. I'm fighting for everyone. But that little baby, that is in the back of my head every second, every topic, every single minute. So I want you to know that um, that's where that passion comes from. And I know some of you are parents. Some of you have you know grandkids. Some of you have nieces and nephews. Some of you teach kids, maybe at school. That next generation needs us. And they need shows like this and they need people speaking out for them. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to dig in. We're going to dig deep. We're not going to pull any punches. And we're going to do it. I'm going to do it from the perspective of my child deserves better than what's going on right now. There's too much darkness. We need to, we need to bring some light back into this picture. And the only way we're going to do that is we're going to break up that darkness and we're going to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this instead. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the show the topics. We're going to be here Monday through Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m. Sometimes it'll be a little shorter. Sometimes it'll be a little longer. We are going to have guests as well. I'm not going to have guests. It's not going to be right now like, oh, every Tuesday. We ha- I want to have guests on here because I really want to talk to someone because I know someone really is going to bring something to the table that's going to make you think and make our lives better. The goal here is to make everyone's life better, freer, happier, you know, feeling better, you know, and we're also going to get on the ground. Kai probably doesn't know this yet, but we're going to get on the ground too. We're going to get out of this studio. We're going to do some crazy shit. If you saw JLo in Enough, you're going to like what's coming. I'm just saying, we're going to do some stuff. I haven't seen it. <laughs> you haven't seen Kai. We need, you need to rent that movie tonight. JLo in Enough. Take a note. Enough. Enough. 
You gotta see it. People at home were like, Kai, you didn't see that? She kicked some serious booty in that um, show. And if you've seen it, you know what I mean. But we're gonna, we're gonna be a badass show, you know? The time for cowards is not now. So what I want is to be outspoken, to be honest, to be authentic, to be raw, and to be um, to be controversial. Because if we're not digging into this stuff, I'm not going to be someone that says, "Oh, this is too much." You know, let me stay away from that. No, this is too much. Oh, then let's take that one. Let's do that one next. That's how this show's going to go. So, with that being said, I do want to do what I'm known for best. We're going to dig into some topics today. I hope you guys are ready at home. I hope you're excited. I sure am. Let's start with Kathy Hochul. Who knows Kathy? Anyone know Kathy at home? Yeah, Kathy is the governor of New York. And I don't know. Let's start with that, Kai. You, you ready on that? We're gonna, yep. I'm going to come to you in a second, but I just want to tee this up. So, oh, where do I begin? New York, the dystopian nightmare. Crime just through the roof. Walk around. You know, you're like, oh, let me go to the ATM. Hopefully I don't get held up today. That's a horrible thing to say, but it's true, actually. I know a couple of people that were held up in ATMs in New York City recently. Um, robberies, thefts mandates at least everyone got their vaccine though right at least everyone had their mask on unbelievable so we're going to start with um governor G- kathy hochel actually put a, a gun control package i don't know if you saw this through this week pretty sweeping we're not going to dig in on guns today because i want to bring a gun expert on and we're going to talk guns we're going to talk two way we're going to you're not going to want to miss that one but i do have to give you um one line that kathy said that was fascinating. Um, Kai, can you tee that up for us? Yep, I have it here. So let's see here. It's good. And in the state of New York, we're now requiring social media networks to monitor and report hateful conduct on their platforms. Thank you, Senator Anna Kaplan, and thank you, Assigned Member Patricia Fahey. Okay, so. That's fascinating. Oh, look, I'm echoing. That's nice. I always I told them before the show, I said, guys, you know, I don't have headphones on. And the one bad thing about that is I don't get to hear that sexy voice. You know how you get sexy voice when you have headphones on? Kai knows. That's why Kai has the headphones. He Absolutely. wants to be sexy. Only that, he was like, I'm coming reason. in hot, be alone. <laughs> I'm coming in hot. Kai wasn't messing around. But I just heard it there for a second. And I have to thank you. It put a little kick in my step. Anyway, um, so you heard that. This is a gun control package, but they threw something, a little a little sweet extra nugget in there from New York that the bill would require social media networks to provide a clear and concise policy regarding how they would respond to incidents of hateful conduct on their platform. This is coming in from Forbes, by the way, that I'm reading from. So you look at that and you say to yourself, hmm, hateful conduct. We can all get behind, that's bad, right? Well, that depends on what you're talking about as hateful. Now, do you trust Kathy Hochul to make that assessment? Do you trust her to make an assessment of what's hateful and what's not? The woman who vilified everyone who didn't want to get an experimental vaccine in New York, you trust her to decide what's hateful? You trust the social media companies that vilified everybody who decided that they wanted to report back with some facts about the vaccine when it came out, the COVID-19 vaccine, do you trust that? Let me remind you of, of, of a little something. I went on The View earlier this year and I was labeled as misinformation. Hateful conduct, is there, does that quickly become part of the misinformation? Oh, you're misinformation, you're hateful. You know, does that suddenly become you? Are you hateful because you disagree with the wrong person or you disagree with the narrative that big tech likes or that big government likes or that the, the left likes because the left controls these institutions, you know? Ask yourself that. You know, I was labeled as misinformation when I hopped on there for repeating what the CDC had said, which was simply that you can get COVID um, whether you're vaccinated or you're not. If you're vaccinated, you can still get and spread the disease. The CDC had already said that I was repeating it, but I was labeled misinformation because it was an inconvenient truth and it didn't fit the narrative that ABC wanted out there or that people on that show wanted out there. So I ask you, are you comfortable with something like that? Does that give you pause? Hateful conduct. What does that look like? What does that mean? Who gets to define it? There's another cute nugget in here also from Kathy, Clueless Kathy, um, on guns. She says this, you know, you have to laugh. New York already has some of the toughest gun laws in the country, but clearly we need to make them even stronger, she says. So Kathy is wondering why 
the crime is going up in New York despite some some really strong gun laws. Now, I said we weren't going to get into guns here, but maybe Kathy should consider fixing the criminal justice system. Maybe she, she should consider that it might be a problem that criminals get out of jail in New York. They have almost no consequence, and then they're back on the streets pretty quickly oftentimes. Maybe she should consider the fact that the police force has felt completely unsupported for the last X amount of years since really the Giuliani years, truthfully. Maybe she should think about what Bill de Blasio did to the city. And I know, Kathy, we're dealing with the governor, so it's the whole state. I'm focusing on New York City, though, because New York City is the, is the biggest problem there. It's the biggest problem. There's a huge distinction. I don't know how much you know about New York. You go upstate, it's like a different planet. New York City is a bubble that is a problem for the state when it comes to crime, when it comes to pretty much everything. And I always listen to people who talk about gun control. It's always fascinating to me. I wonder, I mean, does Kathy think that, think about it, criminal at home, sitting home, says, tomorrow I'm going to go and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold up an ATM. But first, I need to make sure I follow all the proper steps of how to get a gun. I want to make sure I do it all right, Kai. I want to make sure, you know, I don't want to break any rules That'd before be I go much. in. That'd be too much. Right? I yep. mean, that's, that's just not what's happening, right? That's not how criminals, how people who intend to cause harm think. They're not worried about following gun laws, right? So people who follow gun laws are people who are responsible citizens. So Kathy's missing a few, you know, that's why I call her clueless Kathy. But I want to get back to that hate, that hateful language. Um, be wary of anyone using, using stuff like that. You know, we're going to stop misinformation. What's misinformation? Who decides? We're going to stop hateful language. What's hateful? Is it it's just stuff that incites violence? Is it stuff you don't like? Is it stuff that just makes you uncomfortable? Think about all the safe spaces in schools now. It's just about what makes you uncomfortable. So a kid's in a class and he hears opinion he doesn't like and he's like, I'm uncomfortable. That's, that's violent language. May not be violent, may not be hateful, may just be something he doesn't like. So there is a, a very big slippery slope happening. I also have a question in terms yeah. of this. Is when, when I talk to my friends, a lot of what I can say could be considered very hateful. Now, mm -hmm. I mean it in a sarcastic way, and, and we're joking and we're having fun, but how is some somebody monitoring that and being able to be like, oh, that's hateful or that's not hateful? I mean, I can say something and be like, wow, that's like, what is going on here? And it and just if you read the words, it could be considered very hateful, but obviously in a sarcastic tone or they know my personality, they know that I'm just joking or something like that. Right. It's subjective. It's 100%. entirely, unless it's like, I'm going to come kill you. Okay, that's not subjective. And even in that case, uh, right. you sent me a meme and I'm like, Jedi, you're killing me. Right. Like, uh, right. Are, is that hateful now? Like, are you actually right. killing me? Like, and, and you bring up here? a great point. And that, that is the point, really. Because this isn't about hateful speech. This isn't about misinformation. I mean, a talking point went out. Misinformation, use that. All these people challenging what you're saying. Yeah, just misinformation. Label them misinformation. People were deplatformed. People lost their jobs. People, you know, I mean, this, this, is, this is being used to destroy people's lives. So my question is, I don't know where this is going, but I surmise that hateful is going to be quite broad and that it will be used as a political tool, especially in a place like New York, against political opponents before you can blink. So there's another thing that's happening uh, in New York, too. Just, just I bring up New York because I just fled from there. I fled from New York here. And um, it's amazing what's going on over there. And I, I'm going to talk about why it needs to sink in a second. But this is just some of what's happening there. Go Governor Hochul announces that New Yorkers can now choose an X gender marker on your driver's license. We're going to get into gender. That is a hot topic. That is a tough topic that is an intricate topic but you can just choose x you don't have to say male or female that'll do wonders for crime too police on the run we're chasing x what is what male what, what, what's going on here so the world's gone mad the world's gone mad in many respects and new york um california is not far behind in fact they might be thai uh, it seems like they're in a race for who can go mad first. And also, for those of you who don't follow New York politics, and maybe you don't care about New York politics, I want to just remind you again. Can you pull up that picture of, of Clueless Kathy? Yep. Pulling it up In case here. you don't remember, this was from last year. Uh, Kathy posted. This, this one or this one? The photo of her with the children. Let me, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. She posted this. So imagine the tone deafness that accompanies a photo like this. Now, you'll see Kathy's in the back. She's unmasked. All those adults in the back are unmasked, and yet all of these little kids in the front wow. masked, their faces masked. This is last summer, I believe she posted this. Imagine yeah, July having, 2021. July, right, okay. So imagine having so 
such a lack, a profound lack of self-awareness to post that and not realize, hey, everyone in the back was at greater risk for COVID than anyone in the front. Those are little kids. There's almost no risk to them. And also just to put that out there, I mean, that horrible image of mass children, children suffered enormously through this pandemic. And we'll get into that too. We're going to talk to some physicians about that, about what they've seen, but there are learning delays, there are developmental delays, there are health issues that have arisen from this constant masking. So a lot of social and behavioral problems that children have suffered as a result of not being able to see people. Just no- It's not normal to see a society that's masked perpetually. But Clueless Kathy, I thought, you know, well, she thought that was a good idea to post that. Imagine, though, she didn't just take the photo. She posted it. I mean, that's something, right? Imagine, just think about that. Because you go through the steps sometimes, right? You ever do that at night? Sometimes I'll like be like, oh, I'm going to post this, you know? And then I'm like, oh, wait, maybe I should. You know, you, you catch yourself. Yeah, you, you catch yourself. And then especially here, too, because I'm seeing in the article, was proud to announce $35 million funding. And they that it's not a thought of like, this is bad. Or like, no. what, what could be used against this? Or like, how could this look bad? It's more just like, hey, like, this no. is great. This Almost is great. borderline proud of that. Exactly. Like, oh, look, our children are safe. They're masked. <sighs> what do you do? So, and my message about this really... Um, I don't know where you guys are listening from, where you're watching from. If you live in these states, get out of them. (laughs) Get out of them, truly, leave. And I know that's that's a very challenging decision to make. My family is in New York. A little piece of my heart and soul is in New York. My friends, there are many things that I miss about my city. But what I know is that these cities, in order to be rebuilt, in order for them to come back, they need you to leave. They need you to be so disgusted with the policies and what's going on there that you pick your family, your business, your children up, and you say, I'm done. I'm out. I'm going to a place that embraces freedom. I'm going to a place that lets me make my own decisions. I'm going to a place where I don't have to be scared at night because of the crime. I'm going to a place where the police feel supported. I'm done. You throw your hands up. You take your money out of these places, your money, your hard-earned cash, your businesses out. And I know many businesses that left New York and came to Florida that went to Tennessee, that went to um, other places, um, Texas, of course. You do that, that's when the difference is made. They need to feel it. And I, I, and I know people say, well, you want your own city to hurt. Yes, I do. Yes, I do, because I want those policies to hurt. I want them to hurt. I want them to die. And I want them to go away because they're not doing the next generation any favors. So with that being said, one of when I was deciding where I was going to move, uh, what I was going to do next, I had a big decision in front of me. One of the areas was South Florida, which is where I obviously wound up. Greetings. Another area that I was looking closely at, one was Tennessee. That's another hot spot right now, right? I have to go over there. That's Nashville is like pumping right now. 100%. And another place was Texas. Texas has always been known, you know, freedom country. You go to Texas, you know, you don't mess with Texas, you know, all that. (laughs) So I was feeling pretty, pretty good about Texas. Um, But something happened this past weekend in Texas. I don't know if you saw this story. Um, Drag Your Kids to Pride was an event that happened in Dallas. Um, And essentially it was an event where children went to what looked like a nightclub and they it was a drag club and they would dance with the drag queens they would perform with the drag queens they would give money to the drag queens the drag queens would perform for them the kids were there with their parents and or guardians kids played musical chairs in front of the drag queens kind of we have some of the images of the dancing yes. that we can just show for people who missed we it have pulled up here. so that's the kids playing musical chairs you see their parents in the background um, can we show the signs as well? Yep, um, right here. These are the signs that were on the wall. It's not going to lick itself, and I licked it, so it's mine. Now, I ask you, you're a, you're a parent out there. You walk into that place. You see those signs. You don't walk right out? Even if you were well-intentioned going in, maybe you thought it would just be a fun event. I don't know why that would be in your mind because children don't belong in a drag show. They just don't. We'll talk about why in a minute if you need that clarification, although most sane people don't. But even if you you thought, oh, it's going to be a fun, innocent event, you walk in, you see those signs. I mean, people were dropping low, splits, very provocative dancing um, in front of very, very small children. I mean, those are kids. 
So we have several problems um, that are going on. This is this is the sign A of a society in decay. Not the drag shows, but the fact that you have drag shows for kids. One, what's going on with parenting? Why are parents? I mean, take the drag component out of it for a second. Take that out completely. Pretend this is just a regular nightclub. Why are your, why are kids there? Do you take your kids kids around at night? You're like, hey, kids, want to go to the cigar bar? Hey, kids, want to go to the club? At night, hey, you want to go for a happy hour? We can all, you know, pop some shots. This is not normal. This is not healthy. This is not, I mean, kids don't need to be around alcohol and club scenes and provocative dancing and sexualization. This is not healthy or normal. Now, my concern is, did the, A, okay, did those parents want to take their kids there? If so, I need to talk to them. Why? B, are these parents feeling pressured to take kids to places like this so that they can say, well, I'm on, I'm on the cool team. I support it. See, I'm, I'm good. I support it. You don't have to come after me. I support what's going on. Don't worry. I'm condoning it. I'm supporting it. See, I have my kids. Is there a push for everyone to kind of support, endorse this stuff so much so that now children are involved? This is deeply, 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 deeply concerning. And it's not, I was told, you know, when I brought this story to the surface, people were saying, oh, this is happening in New York. There's taxpayer dollars that are being put out there for drag queens to come to schools and they do makeup lessons for kids. What? What is taxpayer funded? What is going on? What was surprising to me is that it did happen in Texas. So that's my point. It's like, this is trickling everywhere. Okay. Now, I said take the drag component out of it for a second. Let's take that component and bring it back in now. I say this, as I grew up in New York City, right? I'm a live and let live kind of gal for adult. I'm like, you do you, you know? I have friends, gay, straight, all stars and stripes. I've been to, I went to a drag club myself, I think for a bachelorette party. I think I was like 22. Um, there's a place called Lucky Chang's. I don't know if it's still there. It's in New York City. It's very famous, can be very entertaining. I would not bring my child there. That's not appropriate. Um, But there was a time when people just wanted to be accepted. You know, I remember a time when um, a friend of mine actually came out as gay to me in college. And I said, we had a conversation. I remember her saying, I just want to be accepted for who I am. I just want to be left alone. I don't want to be discriminated against. And I want to live my life. And I was like, awesome. That's how it should be. People should, adults should, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, as long as you're not asking someone else to pay for anything, as long as you're not asking someone else to endorse what you're doing, you should be able to live the life you want to live in a free society. Great. That's not what's happening now. What's happening now is there are a lot of woke causes and they they don't just want you to accept that you have to, you have to endorse it. You have to say, I support this. You have to put on a pin. Let's pretend this is a pin. It says bullshit, but you have to put on a pin and say, this, I support what you're doing. I'm a fan. I'm, I've got you. Why? Why? I do plenty of things in my life. I don't need someone else to endorse or support. Why? Why are we at that point now? And it's so much so that they need the children to support it. They need little kids. You cannot tell me. You cannot tell me that those little kids were comfortable in that room. They don't know what's going on. They're like, I want to go outside and play. What am I doing here in a room? What What is this? Weird? They don't want to see a, dr- kids do not want to go see a drag show. I'm sorry, but they don't. Adults wanted them to go see that show for some reason, one reason or another. And it's pervasive. I mean, you see Tyra Banks now has that um, show out. I'm looking for, I think it's on Discovery Plus. I want to be accurate, but I think it's on Discovery Plus. Kai, can you just check that? It's a show about, teenage teens doing drag um looking it up right now yeah i I believe it's discovery plus discovery plus yeah tyra banks executive producer of teen drag series for discovery plus right so this is real this is happening this is pervasive what why why do they need it's like in other words this needs to be not only you don't they, they don't need you to say you do you they need you to say that's amazing i love what you're doing i support it i don't just condone it in fact i'm going to make a sign for it and put it on my lawn that's where we're out in 2022 no one should have to do that 
No one should have to do that for anyone else's cause. I'm sorry, and leave the kids out of it. Leave them out of it. Let them grow up. If they decide as an adult they want to go to a drag show, they can do what they want. Stop putting woke political nonsense onto kids. Stop putting kids in places and saying, see, this is cool. You like this. If you go to school, just say you like this. So you'll be in the cool club and no one will criticize you and you won't be. No. Raise your kids to think for themselves and get them out of spaces where they don't belong. They don't belong in the bar. They don't belong in a club and they don't belong in the drag club. I need a deep breath after that one, Kai. Yep. I'm telling you, as a mom, let me tell you, my mama bear claws, <clears throat> it was all different before I had a kid. I used to live and breathe this stuff in a different way. And now I have a child and I'm like, I watched, I think I mentioned this to Kai before the show started, uh, Matt Walsh over at The Daily Wire has a, um, a documentary out called What is a Woman? People should watch it. Whether you love him, you hate him, I don't care how you feel about Matt Walsh. You should watch it. And my husband and I were watching it last night, Jeremy, and we looked at each other and said, I'm scared for where this is all going for my kid, you know? And we're gonna talk, we're gonna dig into some of this gender stuff. And I want you to know that I, all of it is coming from a place, I am someone who is a live and let live type of gal. I am someone who's like, you need to choose and live the life you want. I'm a supporter of freedom, I open the show with that. But there's also such things as facts and truth and reality that's getting lost, and we're gonna dig into that too on that issue. So my third topic for today, I want to go to something positive, something that puts a smile on my face. It won't put a smile on everyone's face, Kai. Maybe Kai won't smile. I think maybe, he will, maybe, though. Maybe, I maybe not. I think he will. I think he will. But some people out there, the statists, the people who like their big government, the triple masked will not like this story. So if you're triple masked, sorry in advance. You ever see those people with the N nights? People still, you know, I got a... Before I get into this, I got a message. This is not a joke. A friend of mine um, sent me a text message. And I didn't feel right about sharing it because I don't, it's a random person. I feel bad. But uh, people are still double masked with um, latex gloves on in the gym in New York City. Really? It's happening. So just thought I'd put that out there. For how do you, those of how you, do you even breathe at that point? I don't know. I don't know. But it's happening. It's happening in New York. Um, yeah, still. 2022. Who knew? All right, so the, the last topic that I wanna cover with you today, and today is a bit of a, of a lightning round because I had to do that full intro in the beginning, but I wanna talk to you about the Special Olympics. Um, and I wanna talk to you about one of the reasons that I came to Florida, and I wanna talk to you about why this is actually limited government at work. So June 5th to the 12th in Orlando are the Special Olympics. They're actually happening right now. Wish everyone luck, it's amazing. And the Special Olympics was in the news last week, so was Ron DeSantis, because the Special Olympics dropped their COVID-19 va COVID vaccine mandate because DeSantis threatened <laughs> a almost $28 million fine. He was like, oh, you wanna put a vax mandate in? I don't think so. Or do it, but just give us $28 million. This is how you win. This guy is a winner. This guy, I'm telling you, he goes to the White House, everyone's in trouble, really. Everyone's in trouble because he's gonna win. If he, if he decides to run, he's going to win. You heard it here first. Maybe not first, but you heard it here. So the Special Olympics dropped the vaccine requirement after the state sent a letter. And the problem was that it violated, it was in violation of Florida law. You can't put a vax mandate out in Florida. It goes against the law as Florida's law states. Let me, let me read you Florida law just so you know what it says. Florida law says, um, it prohibits a business entity, which includes a charitable organization, from requiring any patron or customer to provide documentation certifying COVID-19 vaccination or post-infection recovery to gain access to, entry upon, or service from the business entity. So DeSantis essentially has stepped up to the plate. Now, as a result of this, many Special Olympians were able to participate that would not have been able to participate because for whatever reason, they didn't want the COVID-19 vaccine or they were medically advised against it. Um, so now you have a bunch of people that are able to participate that wouldn't have otherwise been able to do so. Now, people 
a look at this, and this is one of my favorite uh, angles to cover. We covered this actually with Nikki Freed. I don't know if you saw the podcast with PBD over the weekend. It caused quite a stir. Yep. <laughs> Kai, you were there. Yep. There was some fire on that set. Yeah, that was, that was intense. That was intense. It was a good, good debate. It was a healthy debate. We need more Absolutely. of those debates. But Nikki at one point had said to me, well, don't you support the free market? And I said, of course I do. And she said, well, then how, why do you support, you know, the governor telling a business what to do? And I said, Ron DeSantis, A, is not telling people not to get vaccinated. He's telling you if you want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated, but you don't have to get vaccinated. You realize there are people in Florida who go to their doctors and their doctors say to them, and I know this because I was one of them. They go to their doctors and their doctors say, you have X, Y, and Z. Uh, you've had X, Y, and Z. You're not a candidate for this. And they say, okay. And they have these long trusted relationships with their doctors. Maybe they have a secondary medical condition. Maybe they have a complex medical history. Maybe whatever. Ron DeSantis is coming in and saying, I'm going to honor that. And I don't want a big government official or a corporate official to be able to step in and tell you, oh, no, I'm sorry. But even though we don't know anything about your medical history and we don't know anything about you, you have to get this vaccine. That's called enabling freedom also. I want you to keep in mind, this is not, what's happened across the country here, this is not the local mom and pop shop down the street saying, I need you to take your shoes off before you come in the store. And a governor coming in and saying, well, no, that's ridiculous. Let people leave their shoes on. That's not what's happening. You have corporations across the country, and I'm not saying this is happening specifically in this case, but in general, you have corporations with big ties to big government with big ties to big pharma, making decisions. You get a favor, I get a favor. You get this, I get that. I mean, big pharma funds heavily a lot of these media enterprises. You saw there was a video a few months ago, I'm sure you saw it, that was out and said, oh, you know, they would show like the lead in for all of these news shows, cable and network, and it was like brought to you by Pfizer, brought to you by Pfizer. So, you know, this is not a secret that there's an entanglement that's happening there. So, when these corporations and these industries get out of control and suddenly they're talking about injecting your body with something, they don't know anything about your medical history. How dare they? How dare they have the audacity to tell you that you need to get something when they know nothing about you? Thank the Lord Jesus for someone like Ron DeSantis. By the way, where are all the other governors? <laughs> That's where they are, asleep at the wheel. Where are they to come in and say in their own states, you can't do this or you can't do it? There are a few of them, but most of them are asleep at the wheel. Senators, by the way, with the exception of Rand Paul and a few others, asleep. We should have Thomas Massey on, by the way. It's a side note. He's really good on this. Good for you, Ron DeSantis. I'm not saying I'm going to agree with you on anything, but he is stepping up and saying, A, this is not scientific, and his Surgeon General is amazing. This is not scientific because it's not a vaccine that prevents transmission. We know that. That's been acknowledged by the CDC. And you can't violate people's individual health decisions and their individual freedoms like this. So it's unfortunate that you need a government official like him to step in at all, but that's where we're at because it has been normalized and it has traveled throughout the country and every woke company here and there has adopted these vaccine mandates and some have adopted booster mandates despite the fact that they're unscientific and infringe on people's individual freedoms. So it's an unfortunate reality that a governor has to step up and a governor has to say something and a governor has to do something, but that's where we're at. So that's, that's not big government. That's not big government. That's protecting individual liberty and it happens to come from a governor. He's not telling you what to do. The other people who are saying, Bill de Blasio who was saying, you can't go to a birthday party, you 16 year old, because you didn't get a vaccine. He was telling you what to do. This guy's not telling you what to do. He's trying to say, I don't want to tell you what to do. And I also don't want them to tell you what to do. So that is one of the main reasons that I came to Florida. Um, I truthfully, like Florida, if I'm being honest, wasn't at the top of my list. Okay, my hair is not doing well here. I'm just going to put that out there. I knew that. I was like, I don't know. The heat, the humidity, I don't think it's going to be my friend. I'm not a beach girl. I'm not somebody who, as you may notice, you're like, Jed, you look like Casper. Yeah. And I will look like Casper six months from now. <laughs> I'm not a beach girl. I don't, you know, hang out in the sun. Um, Jorge behind me is like, get some sun, girl, really. I mean, just a little wouldn't hurt. You know you thought it, Jorge. You didn't say it out loud, but you, Jorge's not mic'd or he would have said it. Kai's like, Kai's, you're, you're pretty I think Casper he, pro he probably like said me. Chica. 
Yeah, chica. But, but he was yes. like, a little bit of sun. Just yep. a little bit won't hurt you. My dad's at home. He's like, a little vitamin D, just a small amount. My dad's in New York right now. He's more tan than I am. And let me tell you something. I'm Sicilian, so if I want to be tan, girlfriend's going to be tan quickly, but you know, the sun damage. Anyway, um, Florida wasn't at the top of my list, truly. I came here because I saw a fighter. I saw a fighter in DeSantis and I said, you know what? I want to bring my kid to a place where I know that his freedoms are safeguarded, where I know that someone is standing up to these curriculums in school that are looking to indoctrinate. I want to send my kid to school to learn how to read, write, and do math. I don't want to send him to school so that a teacher can tell him what causes he's supposed to be an advocate for. I don't need him coming home with pins and labels saying, mommy, I need to endorse this or else I'm going to be in trouble. No, no, thank you. That's not school. That's called an indoctrination camp. And I felt like Florida was a place, and I still feel like Florida is a place where free thinking people are welcome. So that's why I'm here. And that's why I thought it would be a great place to do the show that we're going to do. What you saw here today, that's a taste of where we're going. Um, Maybe some shows will have one topic. Maybe some shows will have 15 topics. I'm gonna interview some people and expose some stuff in health and wellness that's not political at all. I'm gonna expose some stuff in health and wellness that's very political. And I'm gonna have people on here that are unafraid, that are fearless, and that are gonna say what they can't say elsewhere and that they won't say elsewhere because they're not gonna get a fair exchange of ideas. So we're gonna do all of that stuff here. If you liked this show today, you're gonna like what we're doing here. I hope you did. If you didn't like it, tell me why, because I wanna know, I like feedback. Kai, do you have any comments? Did any comments roll through that we um, can share the, today? The, the main comments or questions I saw were people asking your relationship to the other co-hosts on The View, um, oh. <clears throat> which should always uh, be an interesting one. Yes, I will, I'm gonna address that and then we can head out today, but um, so, you know, I actually had a really good experience. Everyone asked me about The View, you know, for, because it's a big show and it was a big year and a half. Um, I had a great relationship while I was on the show. I actually got along. We didn't have any big fight. You know all that like drama that you hear about at The View? I didn't, I didn't have that when I was on the show. There was a lot of stress the day that we interviewed Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I remember that because I was a big, I was very outspoken about her emails and the fact that she had lied repeatedly and I wanted, I wanted it exposed, and I wanted, I remember that I had wanted to, there was a, a document that Hillary Clinton had signed that said that she knew what the letter C meant. The letter C meant confidential. She had you know, lied under oath, I believe it was, and said, oh, I didn't know what the C meant. You knew what it meant, you signed a document, it explained it to you, you knew. I wanted to show those documents on air, and I remember everyone was like, <gasps> there was like a, a gasp. Um, needless to say, I didn't get to ask about the emails that day. I did get to ask her about um, the fact that she, I felt she was completely tone deaf. And then what everyone saw is that I was fired a few days later, <laughs> which is what, how it, how it, now I don't know if I was fired because of that. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Um, I truly don't know. Um, I know there were some people there at the time that were not very nice that had agendas and were do you not. Think, do you think potentially you were, they wanted they wanted to let you go, but they just need an excuse? Could have been. It could have been. I mean, we didn't have any drama on set, and we had a very good season. Um, our ratings were up. I had just re-upped re for the year. It may have been, listen, they may have been wanting Megan for a really long time for whatever reason, and that was like, maybe. I, I truly don't know. You know, I, and I, I'm honest with you guys. I am honest always. I When I say I don't know, I don't know. But I had a good relationship with them. When I went back... Um, in November, I was supposed to co-host a bunch of times actually this year, um, and I didn't get the, the vaccine. They came to my house, they COVID tested me, I tested negative, they were like, oh, we can't put you on, we can't put you on. I was like, why? I mean, I'm, I'm, you can come test me if you're, I'm You're negative. more negative than them. And I had had COVID and had medical letters from several doctors saying, she's not gonna give you COVID, she has antibodies that you should only pray for. Exactly. Um, so, but regardless, they didn't want me on. I said, okay, I wound up doing that segment remotely um, from home and um, they treated me really badly, truthfully. They, they interrupted me, they knew ahead of time that I was gonna come on and speak about about the vaccine. I did a full pre-interview. I shared my view. I was looking forward to it. Um, 
I had deep love for some, you know, Sunny was at my wedding. I was, I was actually very optimistic and said, great, this is going to be, even though I'm not in studio, this will be a great conversation. And I think I was set up, frankly. Um, and uh, yeah, they treated me pretty badly and that's very disappointing. So I haven't heard from any of them. I don't, I don't need to, um, truly. But the bottom line is, and what I said there was true. Um, and so my words of advice to people out there is speak, speak the truth. People say, speak your truth. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? I used to say that. And now I'm like, what did you even mean? Oh, so everybody has their version of the truth? How dumb does that sound? How dumb did I sound saying that as a dumb kid? Speak your truth. Oh, okay, I'm a cat. Oh, amazing. Brr. I mean, this is ridiculous. There is the truth. End of story. Speak the truth. That's what I did. I went on there. I spoke the truth. I had, you know, evidence to back it up. And it was proven. It was proven everywhere afterward. And when you make a mistake, this is my other bit of advice just in life that I tell, I, I even say to my kid now, he's two and a half. I know he has no idea what I'm talking about. But I always try to tell him, when you make a mistake, acknowledge it. Apologize. You will see that from me here. I will make mistakes at this microphone. I'm human, mistakes will be made. When I make a mistake, you're gonna hear me say, guys, I got this wrong, I'm sorry about that, and here's why. People will respect you for it. Everyone makes mistakes. Every single human being out there has made mistakes. Some big, some small, a mix of both. I've made both, plenty, plenty, plenty of them. Um, and that, that bothers me, that they didn't acknowledge that. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's not okay to label someone as misinformation who's simply giving you know, an accurate description of their own health situation and their reasoning and actually what's going on. And just so you guys know, as just a quick note, um, I had Lyme disease in the past and got over it. I feel better than I did before the Lyme disease, actually. We'll talk about that why, but that was why. I know a lot of people ask, well, why didn't you get, that was one of the reasons why I didn't get the vaccine. And we, we'll dig into that. I'm gonna be very open and transparent with you. Um, but that also informed my passion for health and wellness and all of that stuff that I'm gonna bring to the show. So thank you for giving me um, comments and whatnot. So this is what we're gonna do here. We're gonna call out. Come on now, that ain't even bullshit. That's horseshit. Horseshit, that's one of my favorite words. I didn't even know that was on there. I say horseshit all the time. My mom's at home like, AJ, hey, people are gonna turn this off. There's people that don't like cursing. Everyone likes a little curse here and there. Don't worry, mom. My mom's from Brooklyn. She can lay it on there when she wants to. We all know that. All right, so we are gonna, we're gonna exit for today. Thank you guys so much, so much, so much for being here. We're going to be back here on Monday better than ever. We're going to dig into, it's going to be all topics and all me on Monday. There will be some dancing. I don't know if Kai will be here. We may have scared him today. Maybe, maybe. It's possible. He I'll, looks okay. I'll, I'll have to think about it. I will say that um, he has slightly less color in his face than when he's arri arrived earlier. So some of the topics might have scared him. But no, you did a great job, Kai. Thank, Thank you. you to the team. Thank you to the audience. Day number one, I think, was pretty smoking. So yep. we're going to come in hot on Monday, and we hope you will be here. See you then. Bye-bye.